Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the Upchurch Watson White and Max in conjunction with the University of Florida Levin College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution, who's our co-sponsor today, to negotiate like a pro, um, which means just go get a good mediator. But um, if that fails, um, we're going to try to give you some tips and some insights into what we do and why we're doing them so that it can be a much more productive process uh, for you as well. Um, let me introduce my uh, co-presenter, uh, Howard Marcy. I'm thrilled to be presenting with Howard. He's one of my favorite people. He's a mediator, an arbitrator, and a special magistrate. He was a civil trial attorney for 20 years, um, certified um, uh, um, Florida Bar certified as civil trial attorney in 1996. He began as a professional neutral. He's certified by the Supreme Court in circuit civil mediation, also by the Middle District of Florida, and he's been approved by the Fifth District Court of Appeals as an appellate mediator. He's also a ma member of our Florida Bar Standing Committee on Professionalism, and if anybody knows that subject matter or this subject matter, it's Howard. Uh, I am the co-presenter. My name is Kimberly Sands. I have um, been litigating since 1983, mediating since 2001. That's all I do now, like Howard. Uh, I'm a partner uh, with Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max. I am also admitted in the um, jurisdictions that uh, I mentioned with Howard. Uh, we're both certified by the Florida Supreme Court and Civil Circuit. Um, we're members of um, the Middle District of Florida, although I think both of us probably mediate wherever you want us to mediate. And we're also one of uh, the early pioneers in appellate mediation with the 5th DCA. So welcome everybody and uh, let's go to our next slide. Uh, those of you who uh, have attended a lot of mediations have probably noticed that some negotiators consistently uh, get better results at mediation. Now, Kim and I are going to suggest to you today that there's a reason for that. These negotiators exhibit a high degree of professionalism. They have learned either through trial and error or uh, maybe just intuitively they already know that professionalism matters. Um, So that, that is our goal today, to share with you some of those attributes that we and our colleagues have observed in the really good, I, I probably should say great negotiators, because we certainly do see some great ones from day to day, and explore what professionalism means in the context of negotiation. Now, I suppose a legitimate question at the outset, and one I should try to answer, is what the heck is professionalism? Anyway. Well, uh, it may surprise you, but, that, but professionalism up until the mid-1980s was merely a speck on the horizon of our vocabulary. Uh, the ABA uh, did some surveys in 1985 that uh, really revealed a lot of dissatisfaction amongst the bar. Uh, with the state of our professional conduct. So beginning then, which I, uh, I'll simply say coincidentally, it's about the same time mediation began in Florida. I don't know that there's any connection, but I find it, that it's interesting. In any event, by the mid-1980s, uh, we began to see articles in the Florida Bar Journal and the ABA Journal for the first time that contained professionalism in the titles. And one of those early ones was a 1988 article by William Reese Smith, who was president, I think at the time of the ABA. And he put forward three characters, three characteristics of professionalism, character, competence, and commitment. Authors since uh, Smith have added to those lists of what have come to be known as the C's of professionalism, uh, 
uh, Keith Rizard in the later 1980s added courtesy and community service. Um, I began authoring articles on professionalism probably sometime around 2015. And since then, uh, in articles I've published, I've added civility and communication. So right now, we have probably five or six C's, components of professionalism. So there's no one defining characteristic of professionalism. We're really talking about a constellation of attributes. Uh, and those seem to be now character, uh, competence. Obviously, the good uh, negotiators are competent, civility, uh, you're going to see the good negotiators are, are almost without exception, civil, commitment, they're committed, uh, they're good communicators, community service probably falls a little bit outside uh, the area of negotiation, but certainly there are five, character, competence, civility, commitment, and communication. All of these do matter uh, in uh, negotiation. Uh, Kim and I have received, uh, with Kathy Klasny's assistance, some pre-webinar questions. What we'll try to do today is, uh, to the extent that the content of the seminar doesn't automatically answer those questions, what we'll do is maybe answer some of them directly. Uh, the Florida Bar's preamble to a lawyer's responsibilities uh, has three uh, statements that I think pertain uh, directly or indirectly to negotiation. The first, as a negotiator, a lawyer seeks a result advantageous to his client, but consistent with requirements of fair dealing with others. The key there, I think, being fair dealing, and we'll have more to say about that. Secondly, in all professional functions, lawyers should be competent, prompt, and diligent. There's that uh, competency C of professionalism. And then a lawyer should use the law's procedures uh, only for legitimate purposes and not to harass or intimidate others. The truly effective professional negotiator knows almost instinctively, I would suggest to you that she doesn't have to be disagreeable in order to disagree. Negotiation in the final analysis is persuasion, and you don't persuade by intimidating, badgering, shouting, insulting, degrading, or doing battle. Uh, when uh, mediation first began in the mid-1980s, uh, I was a practicing attorney, and uh, the opening remarks in mediation were generally referred to as an opening statement, more closely resembled a closing argument at trial, and uh, were often referred to as a dance of the peacocks. Uh, we've come a long way since then, and I find that lawyers have improved in their approach to uh, negotiation in, in mediation. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Bob Wolf, and that, in, if any of you are really interested in uh, negotiation and improving your skills, this is a great book, Friendly Persuasion. It may be out of date, but you can still get it, I think, through Amazon. And the crux of what he is saying here is that uh, Mediation is the respectable art of persuasion within two, between two parties. Um, I'm sometimes amazed when I get to a mediation that an attorney who would never think of being intimidating or harassing or bombastic to a jury uh, would be that way during a mediation. Uh, the, uh, certainly, uh, you, you have to persuade if you're in a negotiation, particularly in the mediation setting, you've got to persuade the other side to, to listen to you. You've got to persuade them that you're worthy of being heard. You've got to persuade them that your 
situation and your problem is worthy of their consideration. You've got to persuade them that it's in their best interest uh, to make some compromise and to explore. So uh, if we think about negotiation in terms of persuasion, we're halfway to being a professional. Yeah, let me interject at this point. It's curious that you mentioned Henry Kissinger in that quote, because one of the questions we got was, had you, have we ever negotiated with a Henry Kissinger? And, and uh, you know, what was that like? Um, you know, what do you do with a Henry Kissinger on the other side of the table? Uh, well, this is it. I mean, all the questions that we got prior to the mediation, I feel, are answered by this uh, section where we're talking about professionalism and preparation. So we've, we've had questions that ask, you know, how do you push a settlement value with a, with a difficult opponent? What are some of the most difficult cases you have? Have you ever negotiated with his, Henry Kissinger and what's that like? Um, what do you do about attorneys who don't return calls? Oh, gosh, we've all had that. Um, how do you handle a difficult client? Uh, what are the most common things that are done that stifle potential? What strategies work, work best to counter abuses of imbalances of power? It's all in here. It's all in the question of behaving like a professional. Henry Kessinger was not only calm and cool in the face of opposition, he was completely familiar with what his needs were, or the needs of the person he was representing, the entity that he was representing, and those with whom he was negotiating. And every word out of his mouth was the word of a gentleman, um, but with knowledge of what the ultimate goal was that he wanted to attain. And if you follow those steps and don't allow yourself to be rattled by somebody who is less than professional than you, and recognize that all of this is the art of persuasion. It's just the art of persuading somebody who's going to inherently disagree with you. And therefore, you need to understand what it is that they want, and therefore, what it is that would be persuasive to them to make the concessions that you need to achieve the outcome that you want. Um, and so you work to foster goodwill, and this st starts from a very beginning with an opposing counsel or with whomever you're going to negotiate with and avoid animosity or distrust. Distrust is the death knell to um, a productive, persuasive conversation. And, um, you know, you, what, what you want to shoot for is not that you're, the people that you're dealing with who find you difficult or um, um, unreasonable, but th they respect you and therefore listen to what you have to say and hopefully put weight on what you have to say. Uh, Kim, I would, Go ahead. Yeah, Kim, I would interject one thing here. One of the questions was, what is the biggest mistake uh, an attorney or attorneys can make uh, to stifle uh, mediation? Uh, and that is they start abusing themselves from the very beginning, from, I mean, from the very first phone call in the case, you know, uh, maybe it starts with something as simple as uh, the uh, defendant asking for an extension of time in litigation to file an answer and the plaintiff refusing that, and then the defendant to reciprocate uh, sets a deposition without giving, uh, without clearing it with the other office. Before you know it, by the time you get to mediation, they hate each other and uh, whatever animosity the clients have between them is spilled over. Uh, that is probably the single biggest mistake I see in the mediation process, that the clients brutalize each other from the first time they meet. I, I agree. It is a human institution. And if they dislike you and don't trust you, then you're likely not to have any kind of influence on them in the negotiation process. And we can move on from here. Uh, another critical point is, um, next slide, Howard. Another uh, critical point is preparation. Yeah. And preparation is hand-in-hand, hand, I think, with professionalism. You know, you know your case. Um, you're not lazy or careless with your statement of facts or issues. 
um, you, um, um, you're preparing your adversary and you're informing your client um, so that there are no unreasonable expectations and hopefully there are no surprises. Um, and again, this comes to how can I be successful in mediation? All of these things are the stepping stones toward being successful. Decision making may not turn on a dime for your opponent. They may need to have the information necessary in order to make good decisions. And hopefully you've set them up to be receptive to the information that you're submitting them to submitting to them. Clients, the same thing. If you've got a difficult client, um, then they need preparation more than anybody for what to expect, not only in mediation, but in litigation. Um, and if you've got a really difficult client, sometimes you want to enlist the aid of your mediator um, and opposing counsel to let them know that your client has needs and that those needs need to be addressed. And so if you say things or do things that, um, that are inconsistent with um, what's been discussed previously, that they understand that this is something that the client needs and is gonna be worked through as part of the process. Your mediator certainly needs to know if you need their help in dealing with a difficult client and, and finding a way to, to best communicate with somebody so that they're in the right frame of mind to make yeah. an informed decision. Yeah, one of the questions, Kim, was uh, how do you deal uh, with a situation where uh, your client uh, is wanting you to be hostile, where they're demanding of you, they're unreasonable and they demand hostility from the beginning. And I think you really need to educate your client early on as to what your ethical obligations are as an attorney. Uh, seems to me you need also to tell them what what constitutes good negotiation, what constitutes bad negotiation, and point out to them some of the things we're discussing in this webinar, and also provide an example by your own behavior. It's really easy, uh, and I've fallen into that trap when I was a practicing attorney, it's really easy if you've got a client who is hostile and hates the other party to buy into that agenda. And before you know it, you and your client are mirroring each other's hostility. So one of the best ways I know of uh, controlling a client like that is simply to not be that way yourself. Well, and I think that that doesn't mean that you can't go with it. If you have a client that's angry and hostile, you know, everybody's feelings are legitimate, um, but that doesn't mean that the expression of it is constructive or legitimate. And so you find ways to express that emotion on their behalf. And that may ultimately end up being constructive for both sides, but you do it in a way that's not damaging to your ability to be persuasive, um, even in, in a piece of, of mediation. Uh, where you're appealing to somebody who's not going to be particularly open to your point of view. Uh, we need to move on. Um, so uh, let's talk about the golden rules. You deal candidly and fairly with everybody and you expect that they will deal candidly and fairly with you. Um, once you lose credibility, once you lose trust, it becomes very difficult to be persuasive. Um, dignity and respect by exhibiting di dignity and respect. Um, not violating the trust of another. Um, and over time, develop that reputation that for integrity, honesty, candor, fair dealing, and that um, you, you can still be strong. You can still be a, a zealous advocate, but that's your rep, rep, that's your rep, your rep is that you're a zealous advocate, but you're still, you still have your integrity. You still have your honesty. You still have your candor. Um, you still have your fair dealing. Uh, adversary, uh, being a strong adversary does not mean that you are being an ugly adversary. So we avoid rough, loud language. Um, we avoid ultimatums. Uh, we, uh, one of the questions here was, what are the common things that are done to stifle um, a successful mediation, the biggest mistakes that that um, meet, that um, 
parties make? Well, it's ultimatums. Um, and, and, you know, I listened to opening statements in which one party says, we're never going to pay more than this, or we're never going to take less than that. Um, or they say that in the course of conversation. And if that's true, I, great, I guess, but usually it's not true. And it, it's um, also something that that really puts a, a, a damper on any further conversation because you can't take it back. But, you know, I, I say never use the word never unless you really mean it. Um, drawing lines in the sand, being reactionary to numbers rather than being contemplative in your response. Um, those types of things are things that I, I frequently see negotiators do, do wrong. And then as I, as a mediator, spend the next three or four hours trying to undo. One problem with t uh, take it or leave it is that there's an emotional overlay. Uh, there are a lot better ways of telling people that you're at a point where you cannot go any further, at least where you think you cannot go any further. For instance, maybe this is the best we can do. Uh, or uh, there are any number of things, but the, the minute you say take it or leave it, you're throwing a gauntlet in their face and you run the real risk of their leaving it. Same as the problem with ultimatums. Uh, on uh, ultimatums, maybe the simplest thing you can do is simply ignore the ultimatum and, and put forth your new proposal. Uh, well, and I would ask that, are you really sending the right message when you're saying these things? You can say exactly what you've just said. I, we've taken this as far as we can. I, uh, there's not, I don't have the ability to go beyond this point. Thank you for the conversation. Um, and that means the same thing as, as an impasse, as take it or leave it. Um, it's a now, okay, this is your final number and this is something you have to make a decision on. But, you know, people, it's again, it's a human institution. People react reactively to hostile comments and it's it's counterproductive in a negotiation and i always love the term i'm insulted i like to tell plaintiffs that uh, <laughs> uh, they should never be insulted as long as someone is offering them money uh, and on the defense side i like to tell them you know as long as they're making progress uh, you know, they should not be in insulted. There may be a, a, a better ex uh, comment that I'm insulted is uh, that's not designed, your last proposal was not designed to resolve the issues. Uh, and uh, always a better way, always a better way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't whine. And the professional, <laughs> that's okay. Don't the professional whine. at all times remains There is calm. no emotion. There is no emotion in negotiation. There isn't. You no. can put emotion in persuasion, but you don't put it in negotiation. Yeah. You all the times you can personally to remain calm and cordial. You know, they don't whine, they don't get emotional. And I say there without a goal. You know, if you're a good actor, you might get away with some emotion as long as you understand why you're doing it and as long as it's measured. But as a rule, uh, once you let emotion get into a situation, you're making a big mistake. Uh, never take things personally and leave your ego at the door. Uh, I think it's extremely important that it's not about you. It's about your client and their problem. Uh, all too often I see attorneys let their ego get in the way of the best interest of their client. Uh, and the only way I know to do that is always tell yourself it's a not about me. Uh, good negotiators don't raise their voice. Some of the very best negotiators I deal with never raise their voice. In fact, I've noticed a very interesting tactic on their part. When somebody else starts raising their voice, they lower their theirs. There's something about that. All of a sudden, things de-escalate to match the tone of, of the lower voice. Uh, it's amazingly effective. It's effective for mediators and attorneys. Uh, technique. Uh,
uh, they're always working to cultivate a spirit of cooperation and they always exhibit compassion and acknowledge the human side of the problem. Uh, in, uh, in opening remarks, it may be as simple as, uh, you know, we know you've suffered a horrible loss. There's, you know, there's no way we can begin to totally understand the effect this has had on you. But, uh, you know, we have to share with you today, uh, you know, part of the, uh, of the problem we face. Uh, so those are all very helpful. Right, and the professional doesn't expect capitulation without negotiation. Anytime you sit down to negotiate, information is power. The more you know, the better decision you're going to make for yourself. So you want information, but it's vital to understand that perceptive people aren't going to communicate with you unless some reciprocal risk take place. So there's this delicate dance. You provide information to get information. Uh, it, it's an incremental thing. Uh, and during this process, you avoid setting or, or yielding to artificial deadlines or ultimatums. Uh, one tactic I, I see if that's been effective when faced with an ultimatum is simply to ignore it. Just pretend it, that the other side never threw it out. Uh, another way is simply move forward, uh, uh, say sorry, but we can't meet the deadline. Maybe we can offer another deadline if it's a deadline type ultimatum. Or maybe you can say, look, we can't accept that proposal, but may we suggest always when faced with an ultimatum or deadline, offer an alternative. Above all, the worst thing you can do, in my humble opinion, is to uh, start throwing out counter ultimatums. Uh, I don't think that really uh, it, it gets or, or accept it on face value without without exploring it. I, I I think that's a real important point. Is I will sometimes have people say to me, "Well, you know, I'm not going to do that," and I'll go, "Okay." So it's a no, but it's a no, but, and, or it's a, why is that necessary? Tell me why, and let's work out something that, that does. It's a mini negotiation within a negotiation. So you do test these things. Yes, and the professional actively listens. This gets back to the idea of information. It's critical to understand active listening. You've got to give visible and audible signs of listening. Uh, you probably the best ways, maybe an occasional nod of the head. Make sure you maintain eye contact. Don't clean your fingernails while the other side is talking. Uh, lean forward. Maybe take notes. Let them know that you're listening. Because when it comes your turn, you'd like to think that they're listening to you. Uh, problem with with conversation communication in general is most people don't listen uh, to understand. They listen to reply. While the other person is talking, they're fashioning some uh, sharp repartee. Uh, so do listen. You're gaining valuable information. You're letting the other party know that you are recognizing their problem even if you don't agree with it ultimately. Right, exactly, even if you're going to reject it. I, I remember, because uh, some of the questions are tell us war stories. I had one case that involved a, a man who was in an accident and suffered an amputation of his leg and they had prepared a day in the life in which his adult sons were speaking on his behalf. And these were you know, men crying because of their father's circumstance. And the representatives for the defendant uh, both had their faces in their laptops and were not looking at the presentation at all. Well, whether they're liable, for, their client's liable for that loss or not, this is a human being who's suffered a loss and um, he needs to, 
make sure that the other side understands so that even the, if the other side rejects what he has to say, they've at least heard it and taken it into consideration. The, the failure in that instance of them to even pay attention to his video caused that plaintiff to just get up and leave. Yes, and, and sure, go ahead. And Dave. that's not particularly productive to a negotiation. No, and, and, and the, the professional doesn't denigrate the other party. I remember vividly one mediation where the attorney, it was a workers comp mediation and the workers comp attorney uh, came into the, remember you've got an injured claimant on the other side. The work comp attorney came in, slapped down a roll of toilet paper on the uh, table and said, this is what we think of your case. Uh, I would suggest to you that that probably is not a productive tactic. Um, and uh, also understand the concepts of venting and face. I very recently uh, mediated a case where it could not have been settled uh, had not the defense attorney and the claims adjuster simply sat there patiently and listened to the plaintiff go on and on about all the problems. A lot of the problems were totally irrelevant uh, to the injury that she was claiming recovery for. But to her, they all were, were constituted a soup, a soup of problems and emotional reactions. And to their credit, they sat there and listened and listened without interrupting and let her have her say. A very valuable technique. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think we need to speed it up a little bit. So um, obviously the role of the mediator is not to um, twist anybody's arm or beat up anybody, um, but they do need to facilitate the identification, discussion, and evaluation of issues. Um, a mediator can have a conciliatory influence so that they're able to convey the concepts that the parties want to convey, hopefully in a manner that, that is going to be more receptive um, to, to both sides. They want to foster that communication between the parties. Um, and um, they're bound by the ethical constraints that uh, necessitate that they be absolutely neutral um, in the presentation of that information. Um, a professional, um, and this is a mediator or an attorney, avoids overstating or misstating, overreaching, and thereby losing credibility. Knows who's making the decisions in the other rooms. This is vitally important. Who's your audience? Um, is patient with other people's foibles and with the pace of negotiation. Uh, don't brag or gloat. Um, there, you know, there's no winners or losers. Um, every mediation should be a win-win. Um, you should certainly be gracious um, if you achieve an outcome that that you prefer, because then you're going to negotiate probably again with the same set of players, and you're not going to want that bad taste in your mouth, in their mouths. Don't burn bridges with regard to future negotiations, and I love this. Resist those uncontrollable urges. You know what they are. Um, you need to resist them. Uh, another one of my favorite quotes from Herbert Cohen's book, You Can Negotiate Anything. He makes a distinction between intellectual and visceral opponents. In summary, without reading it, the intellectual opponent, opponent, opponent you can deal with on an intellectual level. But once you make a visceral opponent, that he's an emotional adversary, he disagrees with you as a human being. So I think uh, Herb Cohen's advice there is going to avoid making a visceral opponent the way you would avoid a contagious disease. We're going to go now into another, we're shifting gears a bit. We've been talking about probably the first four components of professionalism. Now we're getting to competence. Uh, 
we're going to discuss with you some of the basic tools of negotiation that really good negotiators know how to use. They're anchoring, crossing the zero line, numbers of semaphore, arithmetic breakpoints, break lights, brackets, risk analysis, the end game. We're going to go through these um, one at a time, beginning with Kim. Yeah, anchoring. I love anchoring. Um, conceptually and in application, but you have to know it when you see it. I'm going to go a little off slide at this point. Let me define anchoring for you. It's a cognitive bias. It's been demonstrated by research that describes a human tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information that's offered when making decisions. And in this case, we're usually talking about numbers, a demand or a, an offer. Um, and, it, and it's so powerful that even random numbers have been shown to influence um, the numbers um, that uh, someone will go to if they don't have any other information to base a conclusion on. So information can be key to this. Um, when, you're, when you're making an anchor number, um, it occurs when individuals use, use that piece of information to make subsequent decisions. And once an anchor is set, other judgments are made by adjusting away from that anchor. And there's a bias towards interpreting other information around that anchor. So for example, an initial price offered for a used car can set the price for the rest of the negotiations. And so any prices in the initial price seem more reasonable. And we've all experienced this before, where you have a new car that the sticker price is you know, $50,000, but, you know, we got it for 48, so we think we got a deal. Well, whether you've got a deal or not really depends on what you could have gotten that car for. Um, and, and that's the, the, the basis behind anchoring. You, you, you establish an, an initial high number or low number as a reference point that makes other numbers seem much more reasonable and acceptable. Um, now, whether it's, um, we, and we talk about, you know, uh, let's see what I've got on the slide here. Yeah, okay. Um, so whether a defendant goes first, um, in what we do, that's typically not what happens. It obviously can happen. A defendant can throw out an initial offer um, and that can become the anchor number. Um, and it works the same way as a demand does as an anchor number. We measure success in relationship to that number. Um, but it depends on how much information is available to you. If you want to make a first offer in negotiation, you need to assess first what your, your best alternative is to a negotiated agreement. We call it BANT, BANTNA. Um, BANTNA in, in some instances may be, this is not where I'm going to make my best deal, I'm going to go on to the next car dealership. It's a little bit more difficult in litigation because in litigation there may not be a better alternative to negotiated agreement. We're talking about litigation. And if uh, all the factors indicate that um, in relationship to the demand or the offer that your best alternative does lie with litigation, that's the direct in, direction you go. But you have to determine at what point that is. So in negotiation, we talk about target numbers and then the reservation point, which is the point of indifference between accepting or rejecting a deal and pursuing your, your better alternative to a negotiated agreement. Um, so what you want to do is estimate your better alternative to a negotiated agreement, your target point, your reservation point. And with that analysis, you, sh you should get a zone of possible agreement, call it ZOPA. Um, and that's a range of options that one hopes will be ultimately acceptable to both sides. But you can see from that one anchor number, you've produced at least three of the other numbers, which is a target number and then the, the reservation number from which you could go either way. You could go with what's being offered by the other side, or you can say, no, let's just turn this over to the fates and, and litigate. Um, you want to do that same analysis for your adversary as well. Um, and this is where information is key. 
um, the more information you have, the better you are in assessing what what your number is and what or series of numbers um, and what their number should be. And that will end up giving you an idea of what the the PowerPoint, I guess, the the, the anchor point is going to be. Um, and this is important because um, you know there's a midpoint rule. And the best predictor of a final price deal is the midpoint from the first semi-reasonable offer and the first semi-reasonable counteroffer. And so as you're doing this, the idea is the anchor point that is the closest to the reasonable, credible resolution, the reasonable, credible outcome before you reach the Banta number, which is, I'm just going to litigate this, is more likely to prevail um, than the number that is further away. This creates, hopefully, a tendency to be realistic about what your negotiated number should be. Now, I realize that's a lot jammed into a very small, um, a very small section. Let me give you an example. Um, a great anchor number I saw was a plaintiff had evaluated what they thought the case was worth and that had several components to it and then they evaluated what their attorney's fees were to get to that point then they evaluated what they thought the defendant's attorney's fees would be to get to that point then they calculated it over time and added interest on it and whatever else they could throw into the mix that would come up with this total number that if we follow this through to the end of time or the end of litigation, this is what you're going to be in for. This is what the other side is going to be all in for. That's your anchor number. But behind that anchor number is a more reasonable number of what it can be resolved for now. And that's very powerful because those numbers are, that anchor number comes from reality. And one of the problems with applying anchoring to what we do is that we don't have, for the most part, finite values. We have values that are subject to risk associated with litigation, um, associated with judges and juries and appeals and costs, and that produces more like a range than a number. Um, so, um, what you okay? Here's my slide. What you what you have to be careful about, and what that plaintiff had to be careful about, is every time I saw them in mediation, they did the same thing over and over again. And by the third mediation, I could figure out exactly what their settlement number was, and exactly where you needed to the defendant needed to be in relationship to that. Um, that their better alternative was not litigation, because when you're talking about costs, well, that's something that goes both ways. So unless it's a um, prevailing party fee only to one side, costs can be deducted and costs can pull that number down and you can figure out, you can do precise calculation as to where they can settle and use that number against them. So when you're anchoring, you need to be careful about being too predictable in what your numbers are and what your moves are. Um, and um, when you're talking about midpoints, recognizing that um, there can't be a midpoint on the first set of numbers um, because the first set of numbers out of any defendant is going to be a zero. It's only after a series of numbers that you get down to where that zone of possible agreement is going to be. If you want more information on anchoring, God, I could spend a whole hour on anchoring, probably more than that. Um, the Harvard University Program on Negotiation um, publishes on the issue of anchoring. It's not precisely uh, on point of this type of negotiation, but it, it can be extrapolated in the appropriate case. And anchoring can be extremely valuable in terms of bringing the other side into your zone of possible settlement as opposed to their zone of possible settlement. Howard, do you have anything to add to that? I don't hear from Howard, so I hope not. Um, so um, an interesting scenario in anchoring is when there's a claim and a counterclaim. And they have values 
that put you on either side of that zero or walk away or wash out uh, moment. Um, if what happens is at some point, a decision needs to be made as to who is going to pay or who is not going to pay. And that anchor number that you use may favorably influence which side you fall on in a negotiation. Um, and uh, once you establish that anchor number, you use the tools of the case, uh, the issues, the information, uh, the strengths and weaknesses, all of those things um, that persuade the other side that your number is going to be more likely to prevail than their number. We probably need to keep moving. Yeah. All right, the next subject is numbers of semaphore. Those of you who have seen the old naval movies, you have the guy with the flags on deck, uh, waving the flags into different positions, sending, sending signals to the other ship. Well, numbers, uh, as we're trading numbers in a negotiation, numbers are just that, they're signals. The worst thing you can do is be the drunken sailor and send signals that have no signal value at all. Uh, because as Kim just discussed, anchoring, if the defendant starts at zero and the plaintiff starts at 100,000 and, you know, the parties are going to be looking at a midpoint, whether it's real or whether it's imaginary. And obviously, between the first two anchors, the midpoint probably is not going to mean a great deal. Uh, but as each party sends a number, they ought to be trying to send some signals. If the defendant is resisting moving in big increments, then that may be a signal that uh, to the plaintiff that, look, we can't get anywhere near where the arithmetic uh, midpoint is in this case. It requires a great deal of patience uh, to sit there and trade signals by in the form of numbers, but uh, it's very valuable. What a lot of people I find don't understand is the value of the time effort investment. When I go to purchase a new vehicle, I have a firm rule. I never purchase that vehicle at the first visit to the dealership. Uh, I rarely purchase the vehicle until I've had three or four phone calls with a salesman uh, because the more time I can make them invest in the process, the harder it is for them to walk away from a deal at the end of the day. And the same is true with any negotiation, uh, whether it's within or without uh, mediation. Uh, do always remember, though, that midpoints can be deceptive, particularly in the early stages, uh, because, uh, you know, the parties may have chosen uh, probably will have chosen anchors that don't really uh, give a true signal of where they're going. Let me add, let me add to that, um, that, you know, I've had in mediation people say to me, well, I don't want them to know where I'm going, which I thought was the most outrageous statement I'd ever heard in my entire life. You do want them to know where you're going. You probably don't want them to know what your last and best number is, but you do want to chart a course so that so that the other side can see where you're going at the same time you also need to be um, capable of and sensitive to their signals if they're repeatedly rejecting what you're putting down you need to look at what they're saying and see whether there's any ability to find common ground by adjusting um, whatever it is your target point may be um, so you don't want to send false signals at all when you're negotiating with somebody because you will get a result that veers off in a completely different direction. Yeah, arithmetic breakpoints. The larger the delta, and by delta I simply mean the gap between party A and party B, the more important round numbers become. Parties as a rule 
subconsciously think in terms of round numbers. If uh, I'm mediating a case that uh, where the delta is a million dollars, then uh, each mil each million becomes a a break point, and you want to be as a negotiator, you want to be carefully attuned to the other party's reluctance to cross a round number. That has signal value. That may tell you that, golly, maybe they're going to $10,000 and they're not going any further. It, you can use that same thing to your advantage. When you start nearing a round number, let's say you're the plaintiff and you're at uh, uh, 15,000, and you gradually move down toward 10,000, maybe when you near 10,000, your increments get smaller and smaller. That sends a signal to the other negotiator that, well, gosh, maybe she's going to 10,000. Uh, so always be finely attuned to uh, arithmetic breakpoints. Let me ask you something, Howard. I occasionally have someone who will negotiate in odd numbers, and I mean really odd, that uh, you know they'll they'll take it down to the cents. Uh, you know it's a hundred and two thousand four hundred and twenty two dollars and forty two cents. And every move is like that, almost as if the number is attached to some internal calculation that they're doing and not sharing. How do you deal with something like that? Well, if I'm the other party, I ask them how they come to that number. Uh, there are, of course, cases where dollars and cents may make a difference. Uh, I mediated a, a real estate controversy recently where that, you know, there was a logical basis for it. Uh, some negotiators- Is there any I reason find, to do it if there's no logical basis for it? No, I think it's just being cute. Yeah, and me too. The, uh, and I think the other party realizes you're just being cute. And uh, if they're smart, they'll say, okay, how do you get to that number? And that puts you in a position of trying to explain it or simply being truculent and saying, well, that's just by number. And, and it gives the other party an opportunity then to to set their own anchor number um, and, and draw you closer to their number because they're not drawing closer to the number that you want to set. Yes, I, I think it's just the parties being cute more often than not. Yeah, I agree, I agree. All right, let's go to brake lights. Uh, one of the worst things that can happen in mediation is for you to prematurely slam on the brakes. Uh, let's say you've been negotiating in $10,000 increments and all of a sudden you just slam on the brakes and say we're done. Well, you've not given any signal to the other side that you're slowing down. So you're going to get rear-ended. Uh, there are numerous ways of signaling and approaching into a negotiation. You can gradually diminish the uh, amount that you're moving. You can send oral messages. We're almost out of room to move, or we can't do much more. Or maybe we can pay the mediator's fee, or maybe we can pay the closing cost on the real estate transactions. There are a lot of things you can do, but I would suggest to you slamming on the brakes uh, is destined to get you in trouble. All right, Kim, brackets. Yeah, so I like brackets too. Uh, they are, I love this line, off, often misunderstood and poorly used. Boy, that's the truth. I have people tell me they don't like brackets and I interpret that to mean they don't know how and when to use them because I've seen people use them inappropriately. And of course, when you're in, as a mediator, you can say to a party, you know, that's probably not a good idea. I do have people say to me, should I bracket? And if so, you know, how? And that's smart to use your mediator. If you've got a good mediator who knows this stuff inside and out, that can be very helpful. Um, so bracketing, you know, if you wanna get, you know, expansive about it, uh, your first bracket is your first demand and your first offer. That creates a bracket, but that bracket doesn't really mean anything um, except as opposing anchors. Um, so I get another shot at talking about anchors. Um, the midpoint is a fiction. You can't rely upon the midpoint. You do need to look at the opposing numbers as potential anchor numbers, but until you start um, making moves 
um, two or three moves, I guess, in, depending upon the nature of the negotiation, you can't start making any kind of predictions about where this is going or what it's going to mean. Um, so um, when to use them? I, I think that if parties are negotiating effectively by responding to each other's offers and demands, there's absolutely no reason to resort to a bracket. Brackets are most important when um, the parties aren't moving or are getting frustrated with the moves of the other side. You'll frequently have somebody say to you, well, they're not even in the right ballpark, we're nowhere close. These are also words of impatience. So one needs to always recognize you don't want to rush this process. Um, the, as Howard has indicated, for lots of reasons, the timing and the process does have value. Um, but if, it, if timing um, is important or if you've gotten to the point where parties are not um, able to move anymore, sometimes the fiction of a bracket can open up information and opportunities um, to have a more constructive conversation. Um, so what, what you end up with in, in the classic sense of a bracket is um, you offer to someone, uh, look, if you will, uh, for the plaintiff, for example, the plaintiff may say to the defendant, if you put $10,000 on the table, um, I, you know, from your $1,000 offer, I will come from my $100,000 offer to 75. Well, that sounds like a pretty good deal because the defendant, because the plaintiff has moved 25 to the defendant's nine. But now you need to start looking at midpoints because everybody looks at the middle. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the middle, but everybody looks. And the defendant may be more comfortable in the lower third and this is, again, a function of anchoring. They may be comfortable in the lower third. The plaintiff may be more comfortable in the upper third. Then the question may become whether or not um, there's this zone in the middle that is um, uh, where both sides have to say to themselves, do I have a better alternative to a negotiated agreement? So you're cre creating a potentially more realistic midpoint, but you're also creating a zone of numbers that you're really willing to discuss with that starts with a new low and a new high that changes the dynamic of where you were negotiating previously. Um, so um, um, I guess that's all I got to say about that. Um, Howard, you got anything you want to add? Um, I have had situations in which um, uh, brackets will be created and then parties look at the midpoint but I respect respectfully suggest that you also need to look at the high number and the low number you need to look at the overlap between numbers uh, you need to look if there's any shared number you can look at midpoint to midpoint and as you're looking at comparing the brackets that come about um, they may that, well, one, the bracket provides information, but two, it may provide new opportunities to communicate with each other about where a case can possibly settle. And that can be invaluable in a scenario in which neither party wants to get out of their zone of comfort, and yet they still are both highly motivated to settle the case. Uh, there have been instances in which the parties offer the brackets, there have been instances in which mediators obviously make a suggestion of the bracket, um, not because they're evaluating the case, but because they're evaluating where the negotiators, where the parties are, and what's the area, the delta, as Howard says, that they, that they both seem to be avoiding so that you can explore whether there can be an opportunity in that area. Um, it expedites the process and eliminates those baby steps. I've had mediations that have had 100 moves in them, um, and then some that have had three um, because they went to bracketing, and it moves things along real fast, relieves negotiation fatigue. Um, when parties get frustrated, when they get hungry, uh, you give them cookies, you may give them a bracket um, because a bracket can overcome that kind of frustration and discouragement that can occur uh, over these numbers. We got some um, 
Okay, so um, th this is you, I think, Howard. Howard? I'm Mama. sorry, I had I had it on mute. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, let's talk about some bracket disadvantages. One disadvantage rises from poor timing or unsophisticated usage. If you start using brackets too early, you can diminish the psychological impact of your initial anchor. Uh, also, if you start it too early, you can reduce the effectiveness of the time effort investment tool. Uh, another disadvantage to brackets if improperly used is you can fail to understand the signal being sent. For instance, you may have uh, one party who is sending a bracket that points toward a midpoint. The other party is sending a bracket that points merely to a range. So there is a real uh, tendency there to misunderstand one another. Biggest problem is a failure to incentivize the other party. Uh, uh, for instance, a, a good example, let's say the plaintiff started at fi 500,000, the vendor started at 50,000. After two or three hours, they've gotten to the point where the plaintiff's at 350,000, defendant's at 75,000. So the plaintiff starts with the bracket and says to the defendant, we'll go to 345,000 if you'll respond at 250. The problem with that is the plaintiff is only offering to move $5,000, uh, but is asking for a uh, $175,000 move from the defendant. Obviously, that does not offer the defendant any incentive. So you have to make certain that whatever bracket you put out incentivizes uh, the other party. Yeah, and um, this is where a good mediator can come into play because mediator has the advantage of being in both rooms and can help uh, the parties not only decide when it might be appropriate to do a bracket, but what might be the most effective bracket to do to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And, you, and you, the mediator doesn't know, need to know what numbers you're trying to get to, but the mediator does have some sense of the numbers that are needed to incentivize the other side. Um, in, in mediator brackets, you need to be very careful how you communicate these things. In any brackets, I'm careful how I communicate them, whether I'm doing it for a party or, or as a mediator number. Um, you, you want to make it clear uh, that this is a number in exchange for a number and who is going to go next. So you want to establish that process up front. Now that's kind of like ultimatums. It doesn't mean that the other party can't switch it on you. They can say, yes, I accept your bracket, but I want you to go next. And that's something that has happened to me before and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's uh, an opportunity to communicate again more information about where a party may rest within that bracket based upon who's going to go next. Um, when I do my mediator brackets, I will typically do it on a sheet of paper um, and make it confidential and that I don't disclose it unless I have two yeses to having a conversation between that bracket and then I get to decide who goes next. So there is no magic to the midpoint. Um, there is no um, preference for a midpoint. There's just a low number and a high number, and whether or not we can reach those numbers on either side and, an up, and consider a conversation in between those numbers. And again, that addresses the risk that, that um, we're talking about here that if the mediators misread the center of gravity between the parties, one party may feel overly encouraged by that. You certainly want to avoid that when you create the bracket. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I do it confidentially and, and why um, you may leave it to chance as to who gets to make the next move. Um, 
So um, we talked about this, I think. Um, I you, know, uh, uh, you have to, the bracket needs to incentivize the other party. It also needs to say something about where you want to be. Um, you need to be in a position, even though the midpoint may not be it, you need to be in a position to recognize that you're probably telegraphing the midpoint to somebody and you need to be reasonably comfortable with that concept. In some instances, you may um, be actually telegraphing any number within that range as being possible and you need to be comfortable with that concept. Uh, you need to make sure you know what you're communicating. Um, and uh, you can't unring that bell once that um, that zone is out there, even if it's not accepted, it's out there. Now, I frequently tell people you can go back to the number that you were at previously, and that's certainly true, but the bracket is still remembered, the midpoint is still remembered. The midpoint, though, can be very deceptive, and it can be the easiest way to pull the rug out from underneath somebody, is if they go along merrily, relying upon that midpoint without testing those numbers within the bracket to see if the midpoint really has any meaning, or whether we are now dealing with anchor numbers in which there's meaning for the defendant in the lower third and there's meaning for the plaintiff in the upper third and there is no meeting of the minds in the middle. Okay. Then and I think we can move reading, on. Reading re-bracket proposals. I like to think of brackets as a dance and if you, you need to make sure you're not doing a waltz while the other party is doing a samba. Uh, so how reliable is your opponent? Is your opponent signaling with his bracket a midpoint? Uh, if so, do you think they're flashing a midpoint higher than where they really want to go or lower than where they really want to go? So what does their midpoint signal? Are they simply sending you a range? That is, we'd like to negotiate between 100 and 200,000 but that doesn't necessarily, in all cases, mean that they'll go to 150. Uh, so uh, you know, does it make a difference whether the brackets are being proposed by the mediator? You know, where, what's the source of the bracket? Above all, beware regressions of the midpoint. That's true even if you're trading straight numbers. Uh, some parties will put out a bracket without realizing that the midpoint is actually uh, a, a retrograde movement from the last number they put on the table. And above all, it's important. The midpoints in each bracket are important, but the midpoint of the midpoints is even more important. For instance, if one bracket is 500 200, let's say that's the plaintiff, midpoint's 350,000. Let's say the defendant has put out a midpoint, a bracket of 300,100, the midpoint is 200,000. The more important number than those two midpoints is if you add those two together and divide by two, the midpoint of the midpoints is 275,000. That may be a better predictor of where this case is headed. Uh, yeah, I agree. Or I, I, I do like to think of these brackets it, conceptually the way I think of anchor numbers, um, which generally would translate to, to keep it simple, that the defendant is more comfortable in the lower third and the plaintiff is more comfortable in the upper third. And then you test to see whether those principles are true, because it may be that the defendant is willing to go to the middle or higher and vice versa. You have to you have to recognize that there's multiple assumptions and you need to test to find out which one is true. Now, framing the bracket, we've already talked about this, but uh, essentially it's vital when you put forth a bracket, whether it's you or the mediator, to know whose turn it is next. For instance, if you say we would move to X if, if we knew you'd respond with Y, if they say we accept that bracket and it's your turn next, mm -hmm. if you say, however, if you move to X, we'll respond with Y. Uh, 
that changes whose turn it is to go next. So always make sure that you frame the bracket in such a way that you know who goes next. All right, Kim? So <clears throat> you can accept the bracket. You can accept part of the bracket, but counter with a with a other bracket. We've talked a little bit about this. Do you create a gap? between the high and the low of those two brackets? Do you create an overlap? Do you share a number? Um, do you go from midpoint to midpoint? Do you reject the bracket altogether and return to incremental negotiations? Sometimes I will recommend to somebody who wants to throw out a, a, a bracket, but it's an aggressive bracket, that they also throw out a lump sum number so that the other side has a choice. Do I want to continue incremental negotiations is that slow and frustrating and not as productive or as interesting perhaps as responding to that bracket and seeing what that bracket really means? Um, or does you know, saying no to the bracket um, basically result in, in no place for anyone to go? I tend to, if I end up with something like that, I don't like to leave it with, um, no exploration of any other numbers. It's a little ab abrupt that we have a bracket and no bracket. Um, what I try to do then is find out what last and best numbers are from either side, and that may in of itself create an opportunity then or later for further discussions from those two points. But it all depends on the circumstances and how resolute a party may be with respect to their numbers. All right, Kim. Oh, sorry. So um, but we, we, I talked briefly about this before. It's important that both parties calculate the net result. As I told, as I mentioned with my example, on the person who did a really good job at creating a great anchor number, but then after about three mediations, it, it also made it very easy to figure out what the net result um, meant to that party if I considered what their costs were going to be, the time and expense and risk, and how they were calculating that in relationship to presenting the risks to the other side. Um, the defendant should try to calculate the plaintiff's net early. That provides insight into what it might take to settle the case. Um, um, if you have an idea about what the, defend what the plaintiff needs, um, both in uh, whatever the underlying damages are, fees and costs, and you can pinpoint that precisely, that's extraordinary leverage that you can use in terms of defining your own number. This comes back to the more you know about how the other side negotiates and how they're evaluating their claim, the better are off you are in the negotiation. Um, but you also need to consider what your own net is sometime. I talked about previously uh, the the zone um, of possible agreement, um, the point of reservation. Um, that's what I'm talking about with this debt. What's the number at which you don't have a better alternative to a negotiated agreement? All right. We're at an end, Kim. Yay. And I think we're right on time, aren't we? Yes. Oh, good. We're, we're a minute short. Okay, so hopefully by God, for a minute, it all made sense. If it didn't, send us an email, uh, give us a call. We'll go over what it is you're interested in. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Uh, this was a lot of information to cram into 75 minutes. The Florida Bar course number is 1908816. N, as in nobody, I'll say it again, 1908816 and the letter N. Um, it's good for 1.5 credits, uh, general credits, and because we talked about professionalism, 1.5 professionalism credits. Uh, I thank you so much for joining us. We're working on our programs for 2020. So if there's subject matters that you want us to cover, or if you want us to revisit any of these subject matters, but uh, in greater detail, um, please drop us a note and let us know because we, uh, 
we live to serve and we'd be happy to um to follow up on that um, and incorporate your suggestions in our 2020 program. Uh, and thank Howard, you, do you have anything thank else you to for, offer? Yes, thank you for listening today. We enjoyed it. Yes, thanks very much, and we're signing off.